Good morning, I'm Taylor Wilson, and today is Thursday, July 4th, 2024. This is The Excerpt. Today, RFK Jr. won't deny a sexual assault allegation. Plus, the latest on calls for Biden to bow out of the race and how a website profiled students and accused them of hatred amid Gaza war protests. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. did not deny a sexual assault allegation in an interview this week. He was asked about an allegation reported by Vanity Fair that he sexually assaulted his family's then 23-year-old nanny in 1998, speaking on the Breaking Points podcast Tuesday. He dismissed the assault allegation as part of his rambunctious youth and said, quote, I have said this from the beginning. I am not a church boy. I have so many skeletons in my closet that if they could all vote, I could run for king of the world, unquote. Kennedy initially launched his bid for the presidency as a Democrat, but switched to running an independent campaign in October last year. He said he would consider running for the nomination at the Democratic National Convention if that was an option, saying that the clearest path for him to the White House is through the Democratic Party. Congressman Raul Grijalva, a long-serving Arizona Democrat yesterday, became the second House representative to call on President Joe Biden to end his candidacy for re-election. His announcement followed Congressman Lloyd Doggett of Texas, who on Tuesday became the first sitting lawmaker to urge Biden to step down. A growing number of major Democratic donors and activists are uneasy at the prospect of President Biden continuing his campaign after his disastrous debate performance last week. Several major donors who have pumped thousands into the Biden campaign told USA Today that they were not given satisfactory answers as to what caused the poor performance. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said the president had a cold, but was not on cold medication during a press briefing with reporters on Tuesday. Biden has said he was feeling the effects of jet lag after extensive travel. Still, many donors want Democrats to consider alternatives. But Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris joined an all-staff campaign call and pushed back at mounting pressure for him to bow out. And Biden made clear that he's not withdrawing, saying, quote, no one's pushing me out, unquote. Meanwhile, 24 Democratic governors met with Biden and Harris yesterday, seeking assurance that he can survive the fallout from his debate performance. You can read more with a link in today's show notes. Amid Gaza war protests, a website called Canary Mission profiled students and accused them of hatred. My colleague Sarah Gannam spoke with USA Today national correspondent Will Carlos to learn more. Will, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Let's jump right in. What is Canary Mission? Canary Mission is essentially a website that contains thousands and thousands of pages of profiles of mainly students, professors, but also professionals who, according to the website, have engaged in protests or demonstrations that exhibit some sort of hatred towards Israel or the United States. That's their definition. It's also quite a shady website. Nobody knows who's behind it. It's registered to a charity in Israel, but it is itself registered to what appears to be an abandoned building in a town west of Jerusalem. So we don't know much about the inner workings of it. You report that the website says that the mission is about combating hatred. What do the longstanding groups that we know traditionally exist to combat hatred say about their methodology, their anonymity, how they work? When the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, for example, decides to call a certain group a hate group, you know, Oren Siegel or Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL will stand up and will be grilled by people like me, by reporters, also by politicians, everything else. They can also be challenged by the individuals who can say, look, this is not fair. You're calling us hateful, but we're really not. With Canary Mission, there's no such sort of process for that because we don't know who's behind it. So they can essentially just kind of name and shame whomever they want. For a lot of these young people, particularly students, that becomes kind of indelibly on their record. So that if you Google a lot of these people, the top result or the top three results is their Canary Mission profile, calling them an anti-Semite and a hater and all the rest of it. 
Is there anything that these students or anyone else who's named on this site can do? Yes, there is one way to get taken off Canary Mission, and that is essentially to go groveling to Canary Mission and apologize and write them a letter saying, I renounce all of my beliefs and all of my ideas, and I was wrong. And then they say they will take you off the site, and they claim that they've taken dozens of people off the site by doing that. But that appears to be really the only way. And what has the result been for people who don't write that letter? Have there been documented consequences? I spent like a month and a half just calling people on this list and asking them about their experience. And I heard some real horror stories. And it should be noted that Canary Mission also will post on X about a profile. They'll post on Instagram. They do a lot of promotion of these profiles as they go up. And people received death threats, harassment, rape threats. You know, it was really horrible stuff. Now... It's the internet, so luckily for most of these people, like that goes away after a couple of days. But what doesn't go away is, like I said earlier, this is the principal thing that you find when you search for these people online. So you have really young people who are in their late teens or early 20s who have the rest of their lives before them, and any prospective employer, any prospective educational institution that is background in these people, this is literally the top thing that comes up for them. You write about a Columbia student named Layla Saliba. Can you tell us her story? Yes. Yeah, so I spoke with Layla a couple of times. She says that something like 13 members of her family were killed in a horrific incident in the bombing of a Greek Orthodox church in Gaza City. And she said that really spurred her into action. But as she says it, she's doing what she would call educational activism. Like, does she support the Palestinian people? Absolutely. You know, that's her family. That's her background. But she says she's very careful not to express hatred towards Jewish people or to the state of Israel. She's not happy with what the current government of Israel is doing, but she says, she, you know, it's not about hating Jewish people. Indeed, she said that what's made that particularly difficult is that some of the people who've really helped her through her trauma over the last few months have actually been her Jewish friends. She's, again, also concerned about her future now that this is out there. So more broadly, what do folks say about the bigger implications of something like this? Will it stop future protests? That's a kind of an undersung point of this, I think, is that in addition to the thousands of people that they've profiles up about who may be suffering negative consequences, a few of the students said, look, you get warned about Canary Mission when you show up for a protest and that there are undoubtedly hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who have been put off going out there and protesting because of this website and that they'll be put on this blacklist and that that'll affect their future. It's really having, I think, a significant chilling effect on the First Amendment rights of students, of professors and of anybody who wants to get involved with these protests. Will is a national correspondent covering extremism and emerging issues for USA Today. Will, thank you so much for this reporting. Thank you, Sarah. Money for food is especially tight for families in a dozen states where Republican officials declined to participate in a new federal food assistance program meant to curb the needs of school families this summer. Summer EBT, or Electronic Benefits Transfer, is the first new federal food assistance program in nearly half a century. The Sunbucks program grants $120 per eligible child to be used during the summer months, leveraging existing programs, including pandemic-era funding. Kids are eligible if they qualify for free or reduced meals during the school year. Families can use the money in addition to other government food benefits. The governors of a dozen states, ranging from Alaska to Alabama to Florida, opted out of the program, leaving nearly 10 million students without the aid this summer, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. All of these states are led by Republicans who have said they oppose welfare, the administrative burden of overseeing food benefits, and what they call overreach by the federal government. All but two of the six states with the highest rates of food insecurity opted out of the benefits. The two exceptions, whose Republican governors accepted EBT, are Arkansas and Louisiana. You can read more with a link in today's show notes. New research shows how the combination of a novel surgical approach and a bionic prosthetic allows patients with an amputated leg to walk naturally. I spoke with USA Today health reporter Karen Weintraub for more. Karen, thanks for making the time. Thanks for having me. So Karen, what is this new surgical approach to amputations that involves bionics? The surgery, basically, instead of just kind of chopping off the limb, I'm oversimplifying, obviously, but connects 
two muscles that are involved in moving the ankle in different ways, actually two sets of muscles. One is your ankle moves backward and forward and also side to side. And those muscles are linked during the surgery so that they are connected to each other. And that way the ankle can move in a more natural position. And also the body can then feel where the ankle is in space. As it is in typical prosthetics, apparently you can't feel what your ankle is doing because you don't have that connection to the muscles. And also the ankle is powered itself. So you are not powering it it is electronically powered, whereas this one is powered by the person's own muscles. And so they feel more in control. It's more their own rather than a devices that's moving them. And really, how does this compare to past procedures? I know you're right in this piece, Karen, that leg amputations really haven't changed much over the years, correct? Apparently that's a joke in the field that they're still doing amputations the way they did them 2000 years ago. The researcher I talked to said that Basically, if you look up an amputation in a Civil War era textbook, that that would look fairly similar to the way they're done today. But there are some people who are working on trying to improve things. And this is one of the major steps forward, as it were, that they've been working on. And how are the few patients who went through this procedure recovering? Yeah, so about 60 patients have had this surgical procedure. In this study, there were seven people who had the surgery and then this bionic device used with it. And apparently it's the combination that's incredibly powerful. So the surgery kind of means that they are able to take advantage of whatever technology is available. And as somebody put it to me, that they don't need a million dollar piece of technology, that it's really just almost anything that can take advantage of this extra muscle control will be helpful for them. And they really were able to move much more naturally. They don't have to adapt to the machine. The machine works with them and with their body in a way that the current systems do not. And so going forward, should we expect this to be the future of leg amputations or do other barriers remain here? So the surgery is starting to become standard in a number of places. It's been done about 60 times worldwide. It's now the standard at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, which is where it was pioneered and is being done in more and more places. It doesn't take special surgical equipment or even a special surgical unit. It has not been done like in the field you know, in a battlefield situation. But other than that, in any modern hospital, it should be doable. It does take longer. So somebody who is fragile or who is not a good candidate for surgery in the first place might not be able to handle it. But in general, the hope is that it will become more or less the standard procedure. The bionics, the specific device probably will be about five years before it's approved and reaches the market. But the pieces of it have already been more or less approved independently. So together, it shouldn't be more than five years before before it reaches the market, according to the researcher who's developing it and also another researcher I spoke with. Exciting stuff. Karen Weintraub covers health for USA Today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. As communities around the country celebrate Independence Day today, a Rhode Island town is home to one of the oldest celebrations. Celebrating in Bristol, Rhode Island started in 1785 when Revolutionary War veteran Reverend Henry White conducted the first of what's known as the Patriotic Exercises, an event honoring military veterans, according to the town's website. Bristol's parade is believed to have begun in the early 1800s. Some Americans began celebrating July 4th in 1777, the year after the Declaration of Independence was signed, but the holiday did not become more widely observed until after the War of 1812. By the 1870s, Independence Day had become the most important non-religious holiday for many Americans. However you're celebrating today, we wish you a very happy fourth from the excerpt. That clicking noise you hear is the sound of sperm whales communicating. But what exactly are they saying? Tune into the excerpt later today, beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, when we will re air one of our favorite episodes of the year with David Gruber, founder and president of Project SETI, a nonprofit working to translate whale speak. You can find the episode right here on this feed. And thanks for listening to the excerpt. You can get the podcast wherever you get your audio, and if you're on a smart speaker, just ask for the excerpt. I'm Taylor Wilson, back tomorrow with more of the excerpt from USA Today.